Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study here at Cornerstone Church. We are so thankful that you've joined in with us tonight online. And for those of you that are in here, we are doubled in size from last week, it looks like. So thank you, Jesus. We've got, we've got, um, we are almost to the double digits, I believe now. And thank you so much for coming here tonight. If you'll go ahead and take your Bibles um, I'm out. The first verse we're going to read is, is Genesis 1-1 here in just a second as we get started. We're getting a little bit of a later start today, but we're going to go ahead and wait a couple of more minutes and let everybody get online as we're joining in. We had a good day Sunday, amen? was a good day here. Spirit of the Lord was here. That's awesome. Worship was great. Preaching was great. God is great. And so that's that is good. That is good. It's good to everybody having a good week. Good deal. Y'all can talk to I know I'm further away, but y'all can talk to me. I stay up here before the cameras on Wednesday night, or I would be out there with, 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 um, with you guys uh, getting the coronavirus with, 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 with you folks. And so that's exactly right. 99% survival rate. We're good. Anyway, so, okay, thank you, Jesus. Hello, Miss Terry Gant. It's good to see you online tonight. Mom and Daddy, thank you. Shorty, we're going to pray for you here in a little while. My brother, all of you guys that are logging on right now to, to enjoy us, uh, to, to enjoy us, to join us. Uh, Bob, Brother Bob, Margaret Lawrence, good to see you online out in East Texas. Thank you, Jesus, for the internet that we can all still be connected. Amen and all of this stuff. We are going to, we started last week talking about the commandments and the importance of the commandments and why God gave us the commandments and we're going to pick up off of that tonight and we are going to look at the very first commandments, thou shalt not have, uh, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. That's the commandment we're going to look at tonight. Let me, let me um, inform you of some things or remind you of of some things we are we have worship services here at church on on campus at 10 30 um, on Sunday mornings we are practicing social distancing and wearing face masks in and out of the building we are not requiring you to wear them during worship service however we have designated the the section on the north end of our building for those of you who feel more comfortable wearing face masks all the time during the service that way you won't have to wind up even though we're going to try to be six feet apart from one another, uh, we just felt like other folks that want to wear them 100% of the time may feel more comfortable. So that's, that's how come that section has little signs on it that no one else does. Uh, 10.30 on Sunday mornings, 6 o'clock on Sunday nights, we're having our, our, our evening worship service and Bible study. This week, as soon as Bible study's over, outside on, and on our uh, pagoda, uh, is that what it's called? patio out on the patio that's a better oh ding ding good job the pagoda, is that what you carry you carry a pagoda right you okay well anyway out on the patio we're going to be having a, an ice cream social Sunday night after church and so come and we'll feast upon God's word in here and then we'll go outside and have dessert on ice cream at the on the patio so that will be Sunday night at six o'clock and then uh, ice cream social around seven whenever brother Rob decides he's he's going to be done and of course then we are having Wednesday night Bible study here at the church at 7 o'clock on Wednesdays. You, all of those services are broadcast um, through Facebook Live, or you can come and join us here in, in person as well. Now, here is some exciting news hot off the presses uh, for this week. The Sunday following Labor Day, September the 3rd, some of our adult Sunday school classes are already meeting, or, or they may choose to meet, but we are going to start having um, uh, family-style small group Bible studies. We are going to ask families to go to our church's website and register so that we can know how many are coming, but the entire family will stay together. Uh, stay together in Bible study. We want to have a count because our, our intentions is to have it in the fellowship hall. Should the number get larger than what we can handle in the fellowship hall, we'll move in here. Should that number get big enough, we will have two what? September 13th, the Sunday following uh, Labor Day weekend. That's when that's going to start is September the 13th. Family style small group Bible studies. Our intentions 
our intentions, we will see what happens in the world and how things change. Our intentions is to have Sunday school, small group Bible studies, whatever you want to call it on Sunday mornings, our small groups to start back the 1st of November. That is our intentions. Is to, is, so I guess you could say this is a soft launch. We're going to do family style for a while, which I think would be fun. Sometimes it's fun to do something that's a little bit different. And then our intentions is to, is, is, uh, is to hopefully be opened back up by the 1st of November for small group Bible studies. But we will wait and see uh, what changes in the world, uh, pandemic or political, if that has a, if that has a, a difference on on all of that also also the Saturday before that if you are one of our small group teachers whether it be uh, preschool uh, children youth or adult if you are one of our teachers Saturday September the 12th we are going to have our, a teachers conference here at the church for our teachers to begin to prepare to get ready for when we start uh, our small groups back up and so that will be led by me here at the church on Saturday, lunch will be provided. And so if you are a teacher in any of our small group Bible studies, we are having a teacher's conference Saturday, September the 12th from 9 till noon here at the, at the church. That's going to be a, a good time. That's going to be really good. I'm very, very excited about that. And so more, uh, I can't think of anything else that I'm forgetting. So let's get into our Bible study. That is a that is enough on um, of all of that. Good to have you online, and as I've already mentioned, it's good to have you guys here with us as well. I said the first scripture that we were going to read in Genesis 1, uh, I was just fooling. The first scripture that we're going to read is actually in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to just read one scripture there, very, uh, very short as we get started this evening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. As we get started uh, tonight studying God's word. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we bow before you tonight. So grateful, so thankful that we can come to this place, Lord Jesus. We can gather in your name. We can pray. We can fellowship around your word. We can worship you uh, tonight. Father, I pray, God, that, that you will uh, use me, hide me behind your cross. Let nothing come out of my mouth that's not pleasing unto you, please, Lord. Uh, and teach us from your word. We love you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand together, if you would, as we just read this short verse of scripture. I should have read the scripture, then prayed, and then you could sh uh, sit down, but that's all right. Uh, uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. As, as, as we've already said, we are doing the... Uh, we are doing the Ten Commandments, and tonight we're starting on to commandment number one. And actually, let's just go back up and, be, and begin with verse one there. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the houses of, house of slavery. You shall have no other God before me. You may be seated. As we, as we begin tonight, I want to back up just a little bit and, and, and begin tonight where we ended last week. And that is God says, you shall have no other God before me. When we see God there, that is, that is God's name, God's first name, the first name that we ever see him given in Scripture. That is Elohim. His name is Elohim. Can you say that? Elohim and and the name Elohim is the first uh, example or or, or um, example may not be the right word it's the same picture of God's character and who he is that we see in scripture we see that word used that name used for him the first time in Genesis 1 1 so there's the Genesis 1 1 that I mentioned earlier that we were going to read I'm turning to it even though I know what it's going to say. And it says, in the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. We see that, that used again. If you'll turn with me to the book of Numbers. If you get there before I do, uh, just wait on me. I'll be there in a minute. Numbers chapter 23, uh, verse 19. We see God's name used again. These are just some examples through scripture of where we see that name being, being used. God, uh, Numbers twenty three nineteen says, God, Elohim, is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. 
as he said, and, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? God's a man of his, of his word is what that scripture is teaching us. And then flip with one more with me, if you will, and flip over to the book of Psalms, where we see the name Elohim again. Psalms 19, verse 1. Psalms 19, verse 1, it says, and the, heavens, and the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expansion is declaring the work of His hands. Elohim. It means that God is power, that God is might. He is mighty. And it also teaches us that, that He is the one and the only supreme God. And so here we are in the book of Exodus. Not long after they departed from Egypt, not long after the plagues. We're going to visit the plagues here in, just, here in just a moment. But here we are, and the first thing that God says to the, uh, the children of Israel, or I'm sorry, the first thing God says to Moses when he's giving him the Ten Commandments is, you shall have, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Let me get back to, let me get back to Exodus You shall have no other gods before me. But on Elohim, that name Elohim again, I want to just remind you of the, of the four therefores that's found in that name. Because his name is Elohim, we, uh, we know that he is eternal. And because he is eternal, therefore his existence has already been established. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, Elohim. His existence is established. I've heard it said that if you can't believe Genesis 1-1, then you can't believe any of the rest of the Bible. If you can't hang the hat of salvation on Genesis 1-1, that in the beginning, God, then you, that there's no reason to go any further. In the beginning, God. His existence is already established. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. His existence is said. Therefore, uh, because his name is Elohim, creationism is correct. So here's our second therefore. Since creationism is correct, therefore evolution is in error. Uh, the two aren't connected, but in my mind, somehow I make a connection. Did anybody hear the speech last night that had to do with right for life and pro-life speech at the RNC convention last night? That was amazing. Uh, we, the Bible tells us that we need to speak up for those that cannot speak for themselves. Creationism is correct. In the beginning, God. God created everything. Not There's not one person sitting here that's under the sound of my voice or one of you watching um, online tonight that was an accident. It doesn't matter how you, um, how you were made, created in the womb. God had his hand in that and you were not an accident. God has a plan and a purpose for every one of us here. Some of us got here easier and had and had, uh, had an easier road than others. But God wastes nothing. He has a plan and a purpose for every creation. Everything. God, uh, creationism is correct. E evolution is an error. Because his name is Elohim, he is eternal. Creationism is correct. And the Trinity is is true the trinity is true therefore redemption can be received there is a god in heaven he had a son that he created named jesus who came and was a sacrifice for your sin and for my sin who was who died was buried and rose again and ascended to the right hand of god and then God sent his Holy Spirit down to, to walk with us, to talk to us, to minister to us until the day that we go to be with him. The Trinity is true. Redemption can be received. And lastly, because his name is Elohim, every person has a purpose. I've already, 
I've already touched on that a little bit. Therefore, the preborn must be protected and senior citizens must be safeguarded because his name is Elohim. What does that mean? What does those last two, Brian, have to mean? What The reason that we know those are true is because God is all-powerful, because God is mighty, because he is the only supreme God, the only God, one God. Jehovah is his name. Elohim is his name and his word is true and those are teachings from his word this is the first commandment that we see and that and yet again it says you shall have no other gods before me so here we go what does each phrase mean we're going to work it out we're going to work out that short phrase tonight and it's going to be so good it's going to be so good. The commandments, last statement I made last week, the commandments, they are a blueprint for a beautiful life. But people today resist rules and regulations. People today, they have no tolerance for the thou shalt nots of Scripture. But I am here to remind us tonight that the law and, and love always go together. Always go together. True love shows rest restraint when they need it. Becky and I were fortunate enough to be able to buy Maddie her first car. And so Maddie has a car. I've given her a car, Michael. My 16-year-old has a car. Does that mean she can just go and do whatever she wants to? No. There's rules there's laws at the Gardner House. We have laid down the law at the Gardner House as to what happens with that. Do I allow, do, did, when our children were small, did we allow them to go out and play in traffic? No. Did we allow them to touch a hot stove? No. There are laws. There are rules. God has given us freedom. God has given us freedom. He has made every one of us uh, unique. He has given all of us freedom to be able to choose. As we go through this, I'll explain that a little bit more. But along with that comes boundaries. A loving parent sets boundaries. Why? Not because you, uh, d what did Brother Jim used to say? That, that discipline is not the opposite of love, but it's the result of it. It's the result of it. So here we go with the first. The first thing we see as we look at this, as we look at this commandment is thou shalt. Thou shalt. I looked up what shout meant, and it said, it said in the definition when I looked it up that that is an old-fashioned term. That was, that was all it said about it. And I was like, well, thank you. That didn't help me at all. I know it's an old-fashioned term. So I looked up shall. Thou shall, and it is a it is a uh, it is a a word. It's a, it's an act. It's a word that shows action of something that will happen. We shall have the victory. Was the, I thought? Well, how amazing is that for the example that it used of it in a sentence? Is you shall have victory. Well, we shall have victory because of Jesus. But thou shalt. Why did God? Uh, why didn't, sorry, why didn't God force us to worship him only? Why didn't he force us to worship him only? You see, God gave us a free choice. God gave us a free choice. Uh, because, because love chosen is better than love forced. Uh, uh, our relationships with our spouse, our spouses in the, in the time that we live, those relationships should be sweeter because we chose one another, not because we were forced uh, in, in, into, into that. So God, God didn't force us to worship him. No, instead he has given us a freedom of choice. Thou shalt. Uh, why does God give us the opportunity to worship other gods? Why does he give us the opportunity to worship other gods? Because you see, you see, in, in this language that we that we see when we when we read the, the commandments, all of them, but here at number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That is a that is a command. It's not a suggestion. It's telling us what to do, but it's not a gun held to our head. There is a choice in that. There is a freedom 
that is present in these commandments that he's given to us. See, it's him, it's, it's him telling us how we can have the best uh, life possible. I hate to use that. I hate to use that term. We all, anyway, this is the book that tells us how to have the best life possible. It's called the Bible. It's called the Bible. That's where you find out how to have the best life possible. Uh, uh, a billionaire in our, in, our, uh, in our country, Oprah Winfrey, has said before, talked about God being jealous. And she said, she said, what do I have for God to ever be jealous about? Many of y'all may have read that before about, about Oprah making comments about God being a jealous God. She missed it. She missed the point. There's not anything that you have. There's not anything that I have that God is jealous of. God's not jealous of. God's jealous for. He's not jealous of Jan. He's not jealous of Rob. He's not jealous of Brian. God is jealous for me. And we see that here in the thou shalt. Because he, why does God give us the opportunity to worship other gods? It's so that we can demonstrate our love for him. It's so that we can choose him. Because see, he's not jealous of us. He's jealous for us. Because he doesn't want anything to come between me and him. He's jealous for me, not jealous of me. So, so why, did, why didn't God force us to worship only him? Well, it's because he, we're given a free choice. He's given man free will. Why, why does God give us the opportunity to worship other gods? It's so that we can demonstrate, uh, uh, freely demonstrate our love to him. God has given us free will to obey his commandments. What does that mean? It means that we are accountable unto him and unto him alone. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. We are accountable to him and to him alone. And to him alone. Thou shalt, thou shalt have Let's look at the word have. Why didn't God say, uh, you cannot own? Why didn't God say, you, uh, you, thou shalt not borrow? Why, uh, why didn't God say, uh, thou shalt not make? Well, Brian, he does in a few minutes. He, he, we're going to get to that one later. But we're talking about this right now. Why didn't he say here, thou shalt not make? Why didn't God say, thou shalt not buy? What God says is, thou shalt not have. Why didn't God say, thou shalt not worship? It's because God, it's because the word have there implies this. God doesn't want us to own. God doesn't want us to borrow. God doesn't want us to make. God doesn't want us to worship. He doesn't want us to have any connection whatsoever with any other God but Him. Well, Brian, what, what's the big deal with that? What, is, what does that mean? God doesn't want us playing footsie with the things of this world, with anyone, anything, any possession, any ideal, any education, any political party, anything that this world has to offer that could take the place of God, Elohim, in our life, he does not want us to have anything to do with it. Our love for the Lord, the New Testament teaches us that our love for the Lord is to be so great that our love for our spouses our love for our children, our love for our mamas and our daddies, our love for our friends, that that should be hate, like hate. The New Testament doesn't tell us that we should love the Lord only and then hate everything else. No, the New Testament teaches us that our love for God is to be so great. We are to value Him and Him alone more than anything so that our love for anything else in our life is like hate compared to our love for Him. How you measuring up? Thou shalt not have, or thou shalt have no other gods before 
me. Not, we're not to own. We're not to buy. I don't care how cute the little Buddha is. We're not supposed to buy it and have it sitting in our house for decoration. You know, we're not, we're not supposed to have anything to do with any other God but him and him alone. And you say, well, Brian, that is Old Testament. Well, we'll get there because there's only one of the Ten Commandments that Jesus changed. There's only one of them that he changed. We'll get there. Thou shalt have no. What does the word no mean? Does it mean, does it mean uh, maybe? It means never. It means none. It means not any. Well, how much time? How much time does the word no mean? Uh, does it mean 50-50? Or uh, does it mean all? It means all. Uh, what, uh, what does no imply? What does it imply? Thou shalt have no. None. Not a zippo, not any, not any. Thou shalt have no. What does it? What does it teach? Let me tell you something. It doesn't. It doesn't teach so much. Here, here's where you may be surprised. It doesn't teach us so much about God as it teaches us about what He thinks about us. You see, He doesn't want us to have any other gods but Him. That also, and on the other side of that coin, teaches that He wants all of me. I love this stuff. Y'all may not be getting as crazy about this and thinking, oh, whatever, Brian. That just means a lot to me. Thou shalt have no. Not only does that tell me that God doesn't want me to, ha to mess with any other deity that man may have made or, or a, a, a false religion, Scientology, Mormonism, any other false teaching that there may be. Not only does God not want me to have anything to do with any other gods but him, but it also, because it says the word no, it also shows me that he desires all of me. Not only does he long to give me all of him, but he longs for me to give him all of myself. Reminds me, many of you, many, most of you in here, Michael, I can't wait for you to be able to meet them, but, but my friend Iris Blue, when she leads somebody to Jesus, Jan, you've seen her do it before, and all. She, it's like a wedding. She says, she says, she says uh, Jane, do you, would you take all of Jesus? Because he takes all of you. No, what all that you know. You know, when we first come to Christ, all of us didn't know, didn't know as much about Jesus then as we do now. Twenty years later, I know a whole lot more about Becky now than I did twenty years ago. If she knew what she knew all about me now, she probably wouldn't have said. She probably would have said no, but. But, uh, but that's not what we do. But we take what we know, and God, God gives us everything. We, God wants us to know all about him, and he gives us all of him. And in return, we see here in this commandment, through that one little word, no, that he in return, he wants all of us. Thou shalt have no. Let me, uh, let me read other, one other scripture, though, before I move on to other gods, and that is this, Matthew 23 37 tells us that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Not only does he want us to have all of him, but he desires all of me. Other gods. Why didn't God say uh, no other thing? It's because, it, it's because a God little g, any God, it, it demonstrates, it exudes passion. Y'all didn't get that. We'll get, we'll, let, let, I'll expound on that. Why didn't God say any other thing? Why didn't, why didn't God say an idol? Because the idol only represents a false God. Why, uh, uh, what, is a, what is a demon idol? It's anything that has to do with spirituality. Not anything to do with Jesus, but stuff that has to do with spiritual, spirituality, a, a demonic idol. What is a Christian idol? It's worshiping, it's worship God uh, with this world by worldly means. Make sense? It's got, an, it's got, a, it's got, a, it's got a feeling of, 
of, of, of Jesus, but it's not, you know, like, oh, I'm going, to, I'm going to heaven because Jesus is my friend. So, you know, there's, there's Christian there, but it's not necessarily biblical accuracy. Does that make, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, Jesus is my friend, but that's not all there is to it. Or I know Jesus loves me. Yeah, well, like I've, like I've said to, before to people on the phone when we have issues with salespeople or anything. Y'all ever got charged for anything you ain't supposed to and you have to make that phone call? And then they try to act like you're stupid? My, my thing to say is always, listen, I am trying to show to you the love of Jesus. But if you keep on, I'm going de- to demonstrate the wrath of God. And so, there's, so yes, Jesus does love us, but there's way more to our Christianity and our salvation than just Jesus being our friend and that Jesus loves us. As a matter of fact, I've heard, I've heard it taught and read recently to where we have focused so much on the love of God that we have watered down the rest of it and it's, and it, and it's, and it's made uh, the gospel not as effective. Some, because we, we neglect the other as, attributes to it. What I'm trying to say here is, is, that, is that God says no other gods. Why, why didn't he say other things? Or why didn't he say idols there? Or, 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 or be more specific about different types of idols and stuff. It's because when, when we talk about God, it alludes and it, and it demonstrates, it exudes a passion. A passion. Well, because everybody is passionate about their God. Everybody thinks that their way is, is right. Well, we need to be passionate about the one true God. And Elohim is his name. And his son, his name is Jesus. And only salvation comes to him because we shall have no other gods. No other gods. Nothing. Nothing that this world has to offer can be, should become a God. As much as I love my children, I cannot adore my children and worship my children above Elohim above the one true God. We shall have no other gods. Why does God even recognize that there's other gods, Brian? If he's the one and only true God and Elohim is his name and and that shows us that he is the one and only and that he is supreme, then why does God even recognize here in this command? Why does he even recognize that there are other gods? Because God recognizes man's rebellion. He recognizes that man will rebel. God also recognizes that there is going to be a Satan, that there was a fall from heaven. God recognizes that in this commandment and that there is going to be false religion, that there is going to be false religion and false teachers. God recognizes that in this command. Also in this command, he recognizes that he has created every man, woman, boy, boy and girl that's ever been born of woman. He has created every one of us to be a worshiper we were all created to be a worshiper the new testament teaches us that that to every man there is giving a merit of faith some some men put that in that faith in the stock market some people put that that faith in their stuff some people put that faith in their wife or in their in their kids they 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 mishandle that merit of faith that's given some man that does not believe in Jesus put him on a airplane that's going down trust me he's crying out to something it may be the chair in front of him that he's clinging on to but he is putting faith in something God has given a merit of faith to all of us and we because we were created to be worshipers we need to uh, we need to contain that that worship that faith and we need to zero it in on him and him alone because thou shalt have no other gods before me before does before mean in front of God's space no God is everywhere does before me mean in priority of time? No, because there is no time with God. Because we also know that, that his thoughts are not our thoughts. And his ways are not our ways. And Peter tells us that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is but a day. So does it mean before? Does it mean time? No, because God is above time. There is no time with God. Does before mean in God's attention? No, because God already knows it all so what does before mean to you it means don't bring a false god into any place of your life at any time and for any reason 
thou shalt not, thou shalt have no other gods before. Let me read that phrase, that sentence that I just that I just read out loud to you again because that's good stuff. What does that word before mean to you? What does that word before and that commandment mean to me? It means that we are not to bring a false God into any place of our life at any time and for any reason. There's not to be anything before him and then God refers to himself as me. How does God feel about other gods? He feels like they are an abomination. What's left? This is good, Rob. So if God says you shall not bring any other gods before me, me. How does God feel about false gods? Well, they're an abomination. So if there's no false gods, they're an abomination and they're gone. Then what's left? Me and God. It's just me and him. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Just me and him. One day a trump will sound or the doctor will pronounce us dead. And in that moment, when that time comes, this commandment will be never more true. Because for that moment in eternity, you will stand alone. Before Elohim, all power, almighty, the only supreme God. And in that moment, it will be you and him. What does the first commandment tell us to do? So seven things it tells us to do and then we're done. And we'll have our prayer time Uh, tonight i'm doing our prayer time at the end instead of at the beginning like we traditionally do on wednesday night because we're broadcast and that way our folks at home can go ahead and have their prayer time with their families or by themselves and and we'll um we'll sign off and then we'll have our prayer time and all here we want to be sensitive to people's privacy because you never know who may see something online and and we just we just don't want to share something that somebody doesn't want to share. So we're trying to be sensitive. We want to pray. We want to pray for people. And we want to share the prayer with people. But we don't want to share anything that might be considered uh, private to other folks. Hope that makes sense. So we're trying to be sensitive to that with our prayer time. What does the first commandment, though, it tells us, tells us to do? What does it tell us to do? Well, the number one thing that this commandment tells us to do is that you are free to worship other gods, but you are ultimately accountable to your creator, the Lord God, the only God, Elohim. Does that make sense? So you can do it, but one day you and Elohim and you're going to give an account for it. So the choice is yours, but there's a payday someday. So there you go. So there's number one. It tells us that we're free to worship any other gods, but we are accountable ultimately to him. Number two, we must make a choice to worship our creator. Worship is a choice. We're created to do it. We were born to do it. We, we have a desire to do it. Even those of, Even people that don't know the Lord yet, there's a desire there to want to worship him. And we have to make that choice to worship him. Number three, we must come into God's present presence. Just as God doesn't want false gods in his presence, he doesn't want you in their presence. He wants you in his presence. This is just kind of a recap, in case you hadn't figured that out. It's a recap. Number four, you must realize that your weaknesses and that you and that your you, Let me start that all over. You must realize your weaknesses and self-deceptions. That man is an incurable idol maker. We're going to get to the idol stuff early, but we are all idol makers. I, I am really bad about being sentimental. Sentimental. You give me something. I become sentimental about it, especially if I like it. Jan gave me a coffee mug at Christmas that says honey on it. I nearly cry every time I use it because she got it for me because that's what I called my grandma. Michael was honey. So if you ever hear me talking about honey, I don't have another woman. Becky's my wife. Honey was my grandma. 
And so I, I, I get a tear in my eye every time I see it. I picked out socks to wear to church tonight. Jan gave me Trump socks. I don't hardly wear them because they're special. Cause Jan, and I don't want the hair. His hair is on the side. I don't want it to. So they're special to me. So I haven't hardly worn them. I'm really bad. And I'm not making an idol out of Jan's socks. I'm just saying I'm really bad about making things special and putting things up on a shelf like that. And 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 and, and, and idol you know, my kids, my kids are special to me. Your kids are. We've got to be careful with the things in our life that becomes precious to us and things that we love. Oh, that car. Oh, that boat. Oh, the things of this world. Oh, we've got to be careful to not allow that to become an idol and come between us and the Lord. Because here's the, George, that's the first thing he'll take from you. It's the first thing that's going to go when God starts dealing with you and trying to woo you back. We got to be careful uh, to not become idol makers. Man is an incurable idol maker. That is why we are constantly having to go to the laver to cleanse ourselves. Going back to our tabernacle study. Every day we've got to cleanse ourselves. Number, uh, number five, to realize why, what does the first commandment tell us to do? It tells us to realize that we have an obligation to please God. All law is an extension of the nature of who God is. To violate God's lie, to, I'm sorry, to violate God's law is to disobey God. It's to disobey God. Number six, we, that we must seek forgiveness when we break God's law. Galatians 3.24 tells us that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we, might be, uh, that we might justify by faith. That we might be justified by faith. The law was our school teacher. Those, those, those laws and stuff, God is not, when I, whenever I was in the youth ministry and we would go to camps and events and I would have opportunity to be able to lead, to lead kids to Christ that I didn't know, but that's the first thing I would say to them is I just want you to know that God is not a God sitting up in heaven with a lightning bolt in his hand waiting for you to mess up so he can zap you with it. He is not. This book, this book is not a book of do's and don'ts. This book is guardrails on the road of life that tells us how we can have the best life. If we follow God's principles in here, it keeps us out of the ditch. If we follow God's principles in here, it's not to keep us from something, it's to bring us to something. And that is happiness and joy and completeness and fulfillment. It's the things, it's when we allow ourselves to step outside, Mike, and do the things that, that pleases this body for a season. The things that, that and, we, and we begin to indulge in the things that this world has to offer, that is when we begin to, to get messed up. It's not when we fall, but, but, but we've got to keep, remember, I always say we have got to remember that we view the things of our lives through the prism of the Bible. We don't view the Bible through the things of our life. When we follow or when we break God's law, we must ask for forgiveness. And lastly, we must be grateful for that forgiveness. The first commandment teaches us to come into the Lord's presence with thanksgiving. Best thing I said tonight. Not because I said it, but just the best thing I said tonight. If you've got to leave with something, it's this. The first commandment teaches us. That God gives everything about himself to us. But in return, because of that word no, he wants us to give all of us unto him. Second best thing tonight is because God says me at the end. And he teaches through that short commandment that all the false gods and all the things of this world must go away. At the end, it's me and him alone. Have you been there? I've been there where the things of this world have fallen and failed me, where life has, has, has spun out of control and I find myself in a situation maybe not of my own making or, or, not, or maybe it was even of my own making and all of a sudden I feel alone. And then I realize that because of Jesus, I'm not alone. And it's just me and him. 
Maybe you're watching on camera tonight and maybe you've had this experience like I have where the Word of God tells us that our sin will find us out and maybe you've fallen like I have in the past and your sin has been exposed, however that may have happened, your sin has been exposed and you feel vulnerable and you feel raw and you're embarrassed, you're ashamed, you feel whatever guilt, but because of Jesus, there's this feeling in the pit of your stomach that you know that he, that he uh, corrects those that he loves, that he rebukes those that he loves. Maybe... Uh, maybe you've been there, and maybe this commandment, uh, if you go back to that time in your mind, or maybe you're there right now, God's desire is for us to have a relationship with Him and Him alone, and everything else in this world be secondary. We're only here for a little while. Amy Grant had a, had a song back in the 80s that she did, and the words said this, In a little while we'll be with the Father. Can't you see him smile? In a, little, in a little while, we'll be home forever. In a while. We're just here to learn to love him, but we'll be there in just a little while. I remember, and I'll end with this. When my, when my dad's mom, my granny gardener, I was a freshman in high school, and she was dying of cancer. And I, I, I wrote her a letter to say the last things I wanted to say to my grandmother because I knew that unless Jesus did a, a miraculous work, she was going to be going home. And the last thing I said to her, Jan, was in a little while, Granny, we'll be with the Father. And you may get there before I do, but it, to you it won't seem long. To you it won't seem long. And I'll be there, I'll be there behind you. But we'll, in a little while, in a little while, we'll both be with the Father. Can't you see him smile? Can you imagine... If we lived a life before the Lord that was pleasing unto him and we had no other gods before him, he was our heart. He was our beloved and we were his. He is our, he was, um, or we were his bride and he was our bridegroom. Can you imagine in a little while when we're with the Father and in that moment when we stand, when we stand in front of the throne of God and it's just us can you imagine I hope that we can see him smile I pray that you can see him smile I pray that he doesn't look at me and say by the skin of your teeth I hope that you can hear well done I hope that I can hear well done and here we have in the and we've got nine more weeks left to teach us that these ten commandments are guardrails they're a safety net to help keep us on the road headed for heaven uh, to live the life that God intended for us to live do you know him do you know him tonight we don't want to take anybody's salvation for granted the only way that you're going to have that experience and be able to see the father smile and to stand before him in confidence uh, brother Jim another thing brother Jim used to say as I as I close for the fourth time Another thing Brother Jim used to say is that we don't want, when we stand before the Lord, we want to stand there as an exclamation point, not as a question mark. I always loved that. We want to stand before the Lord as an exclamation point, not a question mark. Are you watching online tonight and your relationship with Christ is a question mark and not an exclamation point? You can fix that tonight. I can give you the words, but I can't give you the meaning. I can tell you what to say, but I can't put it in your heart. Salvation is not hocus pocus and abracadabra. Salvation is not about the words that we say, but it's about the commitment that we make in our heart. But it all started, my commitment to my wife all started with I do. And 20 years later, we'll, we're still saying I do. When we come to Jesus, he is our, we are his bride and he is our bridegroom. And so would you want to come to Christ tonight? I can give you the words to say. I can't give you the meaning. But with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you want to come to know Jesus tonight, whether you're in this church or whether you're watching on camera, would you just pray these words? Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And tonight, I know I'm lost. But tonight, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, 
for saving my soul. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. You don't need to have any other gods before him. He is your true love. He is your beloved. Forsake all others and to him and him alone cling. Thank you so much for watching tonight. Next week we're going to move on to commandment number two. And I hope that you will join us right here at 7 o'clock for that study. Thank you so much. We'll see you Sunday morning if not before. Bye-bye.